Most systemic emboli, about 80% of those, arise from intracardiac mural thrombi. Two-thirds of systemic emboli are associated with left ventricular infarction and another 25% with dilated left atria in the case of secondary to mitral valve disease. The remainder originates from aortic aneurysms, thrombi overlying ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques, fragmented valvular vegetation of the venous system, paradoxical emboli. 10 to 15% of systemic emboli are of unknown origin. By contrast, with venous emboli, which lodge primarily in the lung, arterial emboli can travel virtually anywhere. Their final resting place understandably depends on their point of origin and the relative flow rates of blood to the downstream tissues. Common arterial embolization sites include the lower extremities, almost in two-third cases, and central nervous system, in 10% of cases. Intestines, kidneys and spleen are less common targets. The consequences of embolization depend on the caliber of the occluded vessel, the collateral supply and the affected tissue vulnerability to anoxia. Arterial emboli often lodge in an end arteries and cause infarction. We are going to look into the case report of recurrent venous thromboembolism and pulmonary artery aneurysm that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. A 48-year-old woman with a history of venous thromboembolism was seen in the pulmonary clinic of the hospital because of cough and decreased exercise tolerance. Her physical examination showed the temperature of 36.9, the blood pressure of 102 over 62 in both arms, the pulse of 96 beats per minute, the respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute, and the oxygen saturation of 96% while the patient was breathing ambient air. The weight of the patient was 48 kilograms and the body mass, which measures the weight in kilograms divided by the square of the height in meters, was 17.5. The patient was breathing comfortably, both lungs were clear. The first and second heart sounds were normal, without murmurs. The radial and dorsalis pedis pulses were normal. There was no clubbing or edema. The remainder of the physical examination was also normal. Imaging studies were obtained to further evaluate the thrombus of the right main pulmonary artery. Magnetic resonance imaging of the chest was performed. There was almost complete occlusion of the distal right main pulmonary artery and bilateral segmental and subsegmental pulmonary arteries that was consistent with thromboembolism. In the area of the occlusive thromboembolic material, there was enhancement of the wall of the main pulmonary artery, which was smooth and 2 mm thick. The biopsy specimen was composed, was conducted, and the biopsy specimen was composed primarily of an organizing thrombus with extensive chronic inflammation. The inflammation in the thrombus consisted primarily of 
lymphocytes and macrophages. Plasma cells were also present but in smaller numbers. Many of the macrophages contained hemosiderin. There was a focal adherent pulmonary artery wall in the specimen which showed healing injury in the media with both lymphocytes and macrophages. You, on the left picture, you see the thromboendoarctomy specimen from the right lung. While on, on the right picture, you can see an organizing thrombus with extensive chronic inflammation. At high magnification, the inflammation is composed of mononuclear cells and foamy macrophages. You can see the mononuclear cells shown by the arrowheads on the left picture, while macrophages are shown by the green arrows also on the picture on the left. The inset on the top right shows that these macrophages contained hemosiderin and this is a different staining uh, that you observe, it's an iron staining. So hemosiderin is shown in blue. After the thromboendorectomy, the patient recovered well. Her dyspnea on exertion and intermittent cough remained stable. This is another case report uh, on venous thromboembolism and COVID-19. A 65-year-old Caucasian male patient presented to the emergency room with a two-day history of dyspnea on exertion. He also noted experiencing a couple of episodes of diarrhea a few days before his dyspnea started where it resolved on its own. The patient's wife had recently been diagnosed with COVID-19. The patient denied any fever, cough, chest pain or lower extremity edema. His past medical history included type 2 diabetes, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. His past surgical history included a remote history of arthroscopic knee surgery. The patient had never smoked and he denied drinking alcohol. His vital signs included blood pressure of 150 over 98, pulse rate of 97 beats per minute, respiratory rate of 18, oximetry of 97% on room air and a temperature of 36.5. His COVID-19 test was positive. Pertinent findings on physical examination included clear breath sounds and regular rapid heart rhythm on auscultation. On this slide, we can see the result of laboratory data with a white cell count of 6.9, hemoglobin level, hematocrit, platelet count. The basic metabolic panel was within the normal range except for the blood sugar of 235. Troponin was 0.16 with normal total creatinine kinase. The dimer was elevated to 2,241. The routine respiratory polymerase chain reaction panel was negative. A computer tomography angiogram of the chest showed moderately large bilateral pulmonary emboli within a saddle embolus shown by the blue arrow on the figure on the left and as well as evidence of slight right heart strain 
and pulmonary arterial hypertension with an associated small left lower lobe pulmonary infarction. And um, the MRI result shows this, uh, showed shows it with a uh, green rear arrow on the right. The patient has start, was started on an intravenously administered unfractioned heparin drip. His symptoms significantly, significantly improved with anticoagulation. The hypercoagulable panel did not show any other active risk factors for thrombotic conditions. It could be said uh, in a conclusion to this case that COVID-19 can lead to an increase in the inflammatory response, hypoxia, immobilization and disseminated intravascular coagulation, all of which can increase an individual propensity to arterial and venous thromboembolic disease. Viral infections in general can lead to an imbalance between pro and anticoagulant states during the course of the disease and it often involves the disruption of the vascular endothelium. Various pathways involving the coagulation cascade, including elevated von Willebrand factor, cause the development of cross-linked fibrin clots. The breakdown of these clots leads to the elevation of the dimer levels and fibrin degradation product levels, both of which are associated with poor prognosis in COVID-19 patients that involve, includes the need for intensive care unit admission and even death, potential death of the patient. Fat embolism is a form of parenchymatose embolism where fat globules enter the venous circulation and then pass to the lungs. The fat globules may pass from the lung circulation into the systemic circulation when the fat globules become lodged in the systemic organs, particularly the brain, kidneys, skin, eyes, and myocardium. Fat embolism is common following trauma, with reported rates up to 100%. It is a common autopsy finding, but while only a small portion of those with fat embolism develop clinically apparent fat embolism syndrome, fat embolism and its effects are probably underappreciated, including at a top autopsy. The identification of fat in vessels is relatively straightforward at autopsy if microscopy is performed and confirmed with appropriate hydrochemical stains. The first recognized case in humans in the 19th century was described. Fat embolism has been observed in dogs in the 17th century when they had been injected with milk during an experiment. Zenker observed fat embolism in 1816 in a man who had been crushed, but Zenker attributed the fat um, from gastric contents. In 1862, Wagner described fat emboli in the lung in a patient with PME, and there was confusion between fat embolism and embolic abscesses for several years. Virkel conducted experiments related to fat embolism on dogs in 1862 and 1865. In the same year, Wagner made, made reports on 48 cases that included many cases with fractures. In 1873, the first description 
of fat embolism in a living person was made by von Bergman. Cerebral fat embolism was also described in the 19th century. In the late 19th century, it was recognized that fat embolism was very common after fractures and in 1924 Gauss classified fat embolism clinically and recognized three forms a respiratory form from pulmonary emboli that manifests by respiratory symptoms and signs a cardiac form from embolism to small coronary vessels with tachycardia, dyspnea and hypertension and cerebral form related to cerebral embolism. And later on fat embolism was recognized in non-traumatic cases. Fat embolism is most commonly seen in the following conditions with a blunt trauma particularly from long bone and pelvic fractures it may be seen a trauma to soft tissues without fracture of bones or following a hip surgery it may it may also follow burns liposuctions cardiopulmonary bypass surgery diabetes mellitus decompression sickness corticosteroid therapy and parenteral lipid infusion. Fat embolism is seen in sickle cell disease and hemorrhagic pancreatitis. It has also been reported in carbon tetrachloride poisoning. In sickle cell disorders, fat embolism arises from bone marrow necrosis. With pancreatitis, there is fat necrosis. Fat embolism has been also reported with massive hepatic necrosis with fatty liver and carbon tetrachloride poisoning that causes fatty liver. It has been also reported in heat exposure, but in none of the cases was it felt that the fat embolism caused death. The pathophysiology of fat embolism syndrome remains poorly understood. However, there are two main theories that try to explain the pathology of this lesion. Mechanical theory described as states that increased intramedullary pressure after an injury forces marrow to pass into injured venous sinusoids causing large fat droplets to be released into the venous system. These fat droplets then travel to the lungs and occlude pulmonary cap capillaries and systemic vasculature. They can also enter the arterial circulation via patent, patent foramen ovale or directly through the pulmonary capillary bed causing the characteristic neurological and dermatologic findings of fat embolism syndrome. There is another theory that is known as biochemical theory. It, described, it is being described as state that the clinical manifestations of fat embolism syndrome are attributable to a pro-inflammatory state. Local hydrolysis of triglyceride emboli by tissue lip the pus produces glycerols and toxic-free fatty acids. These intermediate products lead to an injury to pneumocytes and pulmonary endothelial cells causing vasogenic and cytotoxic edema leading to a development of acute lung injury or respiratory distress syndrome. The biochemical theory helps to explain a non-orthopedic forms of fat embolism syndrome. Fat embolism syndrome usually has an asymptomatic interval for about 12 to 72 hours after initial insult 
and is then followed by a classical triad of finding respiratory insufficiency, petechial rash and neurologic manifestation. Pulmonary manifestations are the earliest symptoms and can be seen in 75% of patients. Symptoms vary from dyspnea, tachypnea and hypoxemia to acute respiratory distress syndrome. Hypoxia is the most common finding presenting in presented in 96% of patients. The second category of manifestations is neurological and it is observed in 86% of patients. Symptoms are usually non-specific and include headache, acute confusion, convulsion, or they can be as severe as coma. Dermatologic manifestations are seen within 24 to 36 hours and usually distributed in non-dependent regions of the body, such as conjunctivae, head, neck, anterior thorax, or axillary areas. Most rashes typically disappear within a week. Other non-specific symptoms include fever, thrombocytopenia, jaundice, lipuria, hematuria, and retinopathy. In severe cases, fat embolism syndrome can be complicated by disseminated intravascular coagulation, right ventricular dysfunction, shock, and death. There are no universal criteria for diagnosis of fat embolism syndrome. Diagnosis is made by clinical suspicion and characteristic findings on imaging methods. Laboratory findings in fat embolism syndrome are usually non-specific. Some patients may develop from the cytopenia, anemia, or even hypofibronogenemia. The postmortem diagnosis of fat embolism is relatively straightforward. When fat stains are appropriately combined with routine histological sections, in the absence of fat stains, fat in vessels can be deduced from hematoxylin and eosin stain sections of the lungs. Fat is removed in the process of developing paraffin sections, but the dissolved fat globules leave vessels distended in the stain sections. However, the use of fat stains increases the diagnostic incidence. Scully reported that the incidence increased from 79 to 93% when using oil red O stains. Fat itself can be demonstrated in vessels on fresh or formalin fixed tissues on frozen sections using fat stains such as oil red O, and you can see that on the right, or Sudan black. And this stain is demonstrated on the left picture. The fat globules are red or black depending on the stain, stain and are visible in vessels. The tissue reaction to fat emboli has been reported to be seen within the first 24 hours. This consists of an initial neutrophil reaction and increases up to 72 hours with eosinophils, lymphocytes and plasma cells present. Emboli can show scalloping and gradually decrease in size and dissolve in 7 to 10 days. Cerebral fat embolism is an important complication. Microscopically, there are prominent petechial hemorrhages. These are seen diffusely in the white matter with sparing of the gray matter. 
During the microscopy, fat is seen as distending vessels with perivascular hemorrhage present and fat can be demonstrated with fat stains. Fat may also be seen in the kidneys when it is present in glomerular vessels. Petechial hemorrhages in skin are caused by fat in vessels, which can be seen in the dermis. Rarely fat emboli may be seen in the myocardium. Fat embolism is common during autopsy in trauma cases. It may also occur in non-traumatic conditions. Identification is conducted through histological examination of the lungs. It can be seen on routine hematoxylin and eosin stains and confirmed with special stains. It can be identified using formalin fixed tissue with fat stains on frozen sections. Fat embolism is very common following resuscitation. We are going to look at the case of fat embolism syndrome published in 2018. A 57-year-old man with a history of hypertension and old left basal ganglion hemorrhage was sent to hospital for right hip surgery. The patient had been well until 10 days before this evaluation when he slipped and fell. He immediately felt a right hip pain. He was diagnosed with a fracture of the right femoral neck by an orthopedist in private hospital who subsequently referred him for an elective surgery at a different hospital. The orthopedic team planned a total hip arthroplasty for the patient carried a duplex ultrasound and transcranial Doppler ultrasound were evaluated before surgery without significant anomaly, abnormality. During surgery, the patient developed sudden hypertension and was resuscitated with 500 milliliters of normal saline load. Within five minutes, his blood pressure was stable. One hour after surgery, the patient became unresponsive after weaning off anesthetic drugs. The patient was unable to answer any questions or follow commands. He had no spontaneous eye opening. The temperature was 36.8. The blood pressure was 110 over 60 and the heart rate was 120 beats per minute. The respiratory rate was 35 breaths per minute and the oxygen saturation was between 90 and 95% while the patient was breathing their non-rebreathing back with 8 liters per minute of oxygen flow. The pupils were equal round and reactive to light with constriction from 3 to 2 mm. Examination of the lung revealed tachypnea and fine crepitation at both lower lung areas. Examination of the heart revealed persistent tachycardia and was otherwise normal. The CT scans of the brain revealed multiple scattered, small, ill-defined, high-signal intensity lesions in the cortex and white matter shown by the arrows. In, bo in both hemispheres, right caudic nucleus and bilateral cerebellar hemispheres. The chest radiograph revealed consolidation at both lungs, more prominent at both lower lung fields, which is consistent with acute respiratory distress syndrome by fat embolism syndrome. <laughs>
Fat embolism syndrome is most commonly associated with orthopedic trauma, with highest incident incidence among closed long bone fractures of the lower extremities, particularly the femoral and pelvis. Risk factors are male, ages 10 to 40 years old, multiple fractures and movement of unstable bone fractures. We'll consider a non-traumatic fat embolism syndrome as well. An 81-year-old man had been diagnosed three years previously hepatocellular carcinoma in the hepatic portal region associated with alcoholic cirrhosis. He was admitted to the hospital on the day of admissions. His performance status was good and his vital signs were normal. His weight was 161 centimeters, a weight was 60. 8.6 kilograms. Other than mild anemia, the laboratory data was unremarkable. Serum lipids level were within normal limits. With triglyceride of 82, phospholipid of 178, total cholesterol level of 149. High density lipoprotein cholesterol of 38.4 and low density lipoprotein cholesterol of 84. The C reactive protein level was 0.79. In the morning, just after coughing, the patient suddenly lost consciousness on his ward bed and suffered cardiopulmonary arrest. At that time, the levels of all lipids, especially triglycerides, were decreased. So triglyceride dropped to 82, uh, was 82 on admission and dropped to 36 after CPA. Phospholipid dropped also dramatically from 168 to 99. And other, I mean like that, and other, um, Indicators they also have changed drastically. Computer demography revealed no signs of injury. Despite immediate cardiopulmonary resuscitation and percutaneous cardiopulmonary support, the patient died five hours after the episode. Autopsy was conducted three hours after death. During the autopsy, the pathologist noted the following. The lungs were reddish and their weights were increased. The left lung weighted 550 grams while the right one 780. The kidneys were also reddish and their weight was about 140 and 180 in the left and right respectively. The height, the heart weighted 360 grams. The thickness of the left ventricular wall was 11 millimeters and that of the right ventricular wall was 4. The coronary arteries showed arteriosclerosis. The liver weighted 870 grams and a well-circumscribed tumor was detected in the right lobe, segment 7. The tumor was 3 cm in diameter and yellowish-white in color. It was classified as the simple nodular type microscopically. The aorta showed severe atherosclerosis. So on the pictures you can see uh, the lungs at the bottom that are reddish and the weights were increased. On the top, on the left, you can see the uh, hematoxylin and dosin staining. The alveolar capillaries are dilated diffusely in both lungs. 
On the top on the right, you see an intravascular fat is confirmed by oil red O staining and you see red droplets. The kidneys were also reddish and their weights were increased. In the middle you see um, hematoxylin and eosin stain in glomerular capillaries that are dilated and this finding was in both kidneys. On the right is an intravascular fat confirmed by oil red O stain and red, uh, red droplets inside capillaries. In the kidneys, most of the glomerular capillaries were distended diffusely and oil red O staining revealed numerous fat droplets in both the alveolar and glomerular capillaries. The liver, um, shown at the top, um, you can see a well circumcised tumor. Um, at the bottom, on the left, is a diffuse cirrhosis and on the bottom, at the, on the right, you see intravascular fat confirmed in glycine capsule. This is a case, um, basically, that we have seen is a case of non-traumatic fat embolism syndrome. Amniotic fluid embolism is an unforeseeable life-threatening complication of childbirth. It was first described in 1926 by J. R. Meyer and its clinical and morphological features were described by Steiner and Lesbal in 1941. Despite an incidence rate that ranges from only 2 to 8 Cases per 100,000 100, births in different countries, amniotic fluid embolism is one of the leading causes of death resulting directly from childbirth, accounting for 5 to 15 percent of cases worldwide. According to statistics, it is the most common cause of maternal death in Australia and the second most common cause in the US and the United Kingdom. These are underestimates uh, of the rate of non-fatal and fatal amniotic fluid embolism due to the heterogeneous diagnostic criteria and the unreliability of physicians' death certificates. In industrialized countries, case-related maternal mortality is between 13.5 and 44% and perinatal mortality is between 7 and 38 percent. Between 24 and 50 percent of surviving children manifest persistent neurological deficits. Rapid diagnosis and immediate obstetric and intensive care play a decisive role in maternal prognosis and survival. The pathogenesis of amniotic fluid embolism is not yet fully understood. Amniotic fluid can enter the maternal circulation via endocervical vein, veins, lesions of the uterus or the site of the placental attachment. Although previously proposed explanations of the development of amniotic fluid embolism envisaged a purely mechanical obstruction of the pulmonary vessels by amniotic fluid components, today humoral and immunological factors are considered to be responsible. This is because, in addition to insoluble fetal components, amniotic fluid also contains numerous vasoactive substances, including bradykinin, histamine and others, as well as procoagulant substances that can lead to endothelial activation and massive inflammatory reaction. These and other immunological and clinical similarities to anaphylactic shock have led to anaphylactoid reaction hypothesis. Um, that 
is still very controversial. Another pathophysiological mechanism may be complement activation triggering amniotic fluid embolism. Why some women tolerate the transfer of amniotic fluid or its components with no problems or clinical symptoms, while others do not, is currently a subject of speculation. It is also unclear whether allergic diatheses or previous sensitization to specific fetal antigens can become the disposing factors for amniotic fluid embolism. Amniotic fluid embolism occurs during labor and delivery. It happens in 55 to 76 uh, cases of cesarean sections or it can happen up to 48 hours postpartum. In rare cases, it also occurs during pregnancy following intraurine surgery in cases of abortion or blunt abdominal trauma. The main risk factors of amniotic fluid embolism include maternal age of 35 years or above, cesarean delivery, placenta previa, and multiple pregnancies. Um, there are several diagnostic criteria for amniotic fluid embolism and you can see them on this slide. For example, no other clear cause. Acute cardiovascular collapse with one or more of the following signs. Acute fetal compromise, cardiac arrest, cardiac arrhythmia, coagulopathy, hypertension, maternal hemorrhage, premonitory symptoms including restlessness, anxiety and agitation, seizures and uh, shortness of breath. The unexpected death of pregnant women during childbirth can lead to accusations against the physician if relatives suspect that the cause of death was a treatment error. Even in the event of death from extensive hemorrhage, evidence of amniotic fluid embolism can explain what has occurred and can relieve the treating physician of the accusation of violation of the regulation of medical practice. For example, evaluation of cause of death showed that in 30 to 40 percent of cases of histologically confirmed amniotic fluid embolism, the clinical conclusion had been hemorrhagic shock and amniotic fluid embolism has not been considered as the indirect cause. Macropathological findings are non-specific cause of death should not be determined without careful histological examination. Detection of formed amniotic fluid components, such as usually lamellar, adjacent epidermal squamous, meconium components or lanuga hairs in the pulmonary blood flow constitutes histological evidence of amniotic fluid embolism. Embolic material is found mainly in the pulmonary arterioles and capillaries. Fibrin thrombi, sometimes in connection with amniotic fluid components, are universal and can be detected even after a survival time of two hours or more. A blood vessel enclosed by lamellar epithelial Warmers, long, shown by this long dotted arrow on the top picture, embedded in a fibrin thrombus, uh, shown by two adjacent arrows. The lower part of the picture shows a transparent cylindrical structure corresponding to lanuga hair. In addition to conventional stains, 
such as hematoxylin and dosing as a surveillance team, Sudan 3 shows fatty substances as, and appears or alcyon blue shows, allows to visualize mucus Immune histochemical staining of fetal epithelial cells using cytokeratin is also used as a standard procedure these days. This allows the severity of this allows to understand the severity of amniotic fluid embolism, and it shows it allows to assess it more precisely. For mild amniotic fluid embolism with simultaneous interference by autolysis, epithelial squamous in the pulmonary capillaries can only be visualized following immune histochemical staining with cytokeratin. However, morphologically determined severity of amniotic fluid embolism does not correlate with severity of clinical symptoms. We can look at the next case of death mechanism of amniotic fluid embolism uh, with anaphylactic shock. A 38-year-old woman was admitted to a hospital for awaiting delivery for her conceiving for 41 plus 1 weeks and experiencing abdominal pain for one day. On the day after her admission, clinical manifestations of shock were performed twice on her respectively during the process of labor after complete curettage of uterine cavity and she died soon after the second event. The sclera, conjunctiva, lips and all the nail beds of her hands and feet were pallor. There was some reddish liquid in bilateral pleural cavities and also in pericardial cavity. The spleen envelope shriveled. The uterus wall was osteoporosis and soft with a rough membrane surface of posterior paris and without laceration and perforation. Besides several vesicles that ranged between 0.3 to 0.5 cm found in the sections of cervix uteri, the mucous membrane was smooth. There was no obvious anomaly in the rest. Amniotic fluid components, mainly cuticulated epithelium shown on the left and meconium, were found in a number of small blood vessels and capillaries and transparent thrombosis shown on the right were seen in some capillaries. A little homogeneous or cotton-shaped amorphous material was observed in some pulmonary, pulmonary alveoli, shown on the left. A few hemorrhagic infractions in lung. Amniotic fluid embolism is a rare and severe obstetric complication which affects women during labor, delivery or postpartum. Some classic clinical manifestations, such as dysphoria, shiva, emesis, barking, dyspnea, cyanosis, rapid shock, and so forth, can appear in the maternals with amniotic fluid embolism. The patients with a rapid onset may die within a few minutes, and others, after the recovery of blood pressure, often suffer postpartum hemorrhage blood discoagulate and sometimes systemic bleeding tendency, finally followed by renal failure, pulmonary failure, cardiac failure or multiple organ failure. To diagnose amniotic fluid embolism, it is important to understand the typical clinical symptoms, dyspnea, cyanosis, cardiovascular dysfunction, hemorrhage, coma, uh, fetus composition detected in the maternal blood, and DSC. In, the case, in this case, amniotic fluid components, mainly cultivated epithelium, uh, 
and meconium were found in a number of small blood vessels and capillaries, and transparent thrombosis was seen in some capillaries. In view of this, the diagnosis of amniotic fluid embolism was not very difficult to make. We are continuing this discussion with um, gas embolism. Gas bubbles within the circulation can coalesce and obstruct vascular flow and cause distal ischemic injury. Thus, a small volume of air trapped in a coronary artery during bypass surgery or introduced into the cerebral arterial circulation by neurosurgery performed in an upright sitting position can occlude flow with dire consequences. Small venous gas emboli generally have no deleterious effects, but sufficient air can enter the pulmonary circulation inadvertently during obstetric procedures or as a consequence of a chest wall injury to cause hypoxia and very large venous emboli may rest in the heart and cause death. A particular form of gas embolism, called decompression sickness, is caused by sudden changes in atmospheric pressure. Those scuba divers, underwater construction workers and persons in unpressurized aircraft who undergoes rapid ascent are at risk. When air is breathed at high pressure during a deep sea dive or increased amounts of gas, particularly nitrogen, they dissolve in the blood and tissue. If the diver then ascends, the pressure rises too rapidly. The nitrogen expands in the tissues and bubbles out of solution in the blood to form gas emboli, which causes tissue ischemia. On the pictures here on this slide you can see gas emboli shown by the red stars in the brain tissue. Rapid formation of gas bubbles within skeletal muscles and supporting tissues in and about joints is responsible for the painful condition called the bends so named in the 8080s because the afflicted person arched the back in a manner reminiscent of then popular women's fashion pose called the Grecian bend. Gas bubbles in the pulmonary vasculature causes edema, hemorrhage, focal atelectasis or emphysema, leading to respiratory distress the so-called chokes. A more chronic form of decompression sickness is called Kisson disease, named for pressurized underwater vessels used during bridge construction. In Kisson disease, a recurrent or persistent gas emboli in the bones lead to multifocal ischemic necrosis. The heads of the femurs tibia and humeri are most commonly affected. We are going to look at the case of embolism um, reported in Spain. A professional, professional coral fisherman aged 30 years was working at the Spanish coast in the proximity of Cadiz. The police was called from a ship who later arrived, that later arrived at the port with the corpse of a young man. The forensic med medical external examination of the body showed an extensive blood tinged proof extended all over the face, mouth and proximal respiratory tract. The assistant personnel on the ship told the police that the man was 40 minutes under the water at a depth of 75 meters. After that time, the personnel of the ship went to look for him and finally found him dead. <laughs>
The autopsy demonstrated the air in myocardium vessels shown on the right and compression of the myocardites shown on the left. Microscopical investigation demonstrated the presence of air bubbles inside the vascular net of the kidneys. On the left picture you see an air bubble inside a renal arterial with a red star. Note how the pressure of the air bubble dilates the vascular lumen of the arterial. On the right picture you can see an air bubble in the capillaries located in the medulla shown with the black stump. A more chronic form of decompression sickness is known as Kisson disease. And I would like you to read a, um, an article, a survey of neurological decompression illness in commercial breath hole divers known as AMA in Japan, where you can find results of a survey uh, to determine the risk factors of neurological disorders for Japanese armor breath hold drivers by examining the prevalence of diving accidents among assisted and unassisted armor drivers. The authors found the stroke-like events that occurred exclusively in assisted armor divers and that they were correl correlated with dive depth, dive time and surface interval. This result suggests the accumulation of inert gas with time and breath.